Welcome to the Maple Leafs Lounge brought to you by the Hockey Writers. I'm your host, Kevin Armstrong. We've got lots to talk about today, but of course, we first must pass along from all of us at the Maple Leafs Lounge and at the Hockey Writers our best wishes to John Tavares, who uh, suffered that unfortunate injury in game one against the Canadians. We're all thinking of John Tavares, and obviously all of us here want to see the best hockey players playing the best hockey, best sport on the planet. So get well soon to John Tavares. Now, I feel a little bit like Steve Harvey today, because as you can see, we've got some, some new friends with us today in the Maple Leafs Lounge. Everyone's always welcome, but we got two from the, Ma from the Maple Leafs and two from the Montreal Canadiens, but we're all family here, sometimes... There can be a little bit of a feud and we're into one right now because it's playoff time between the two most storied franchises in our beloved sport. So for that, we have got Treg Wilson and Blaine Potvin from Montreal and Alex Hobson, Peter Barracchini from Toronto. We're going to start by playing nice on this one, boys. I'm going to ask Peter Barracchini to start us off playing nice in the sandbox Tell us something that you think Montreal has done well in games one and two of this series. Um, they wanted it to be a physical series and they, they've been laying the boom. They've been playing the body as much as possible, trying to take as much spaces away from, you know, the top guys um, in game one. We saw that very much, very present Toronto to try to fight back, but I guess, you know, with what happened, maybe they were still reeling a little bit from the emotion and they got themselves caught up in it because, you know, it's something that impacted them. But in game two, it was tick for tack. We saw bodies flying and um, it was just, it, it, it was the epitome of what playoff hockey should be. And Montreal still did a good job of trying to like be that force on the Maple Leaf star players. But I guess Toronto found that just a little bit of wiggle room to get by and get on the score sheet is uh as opposed to game one one of the first times this season that toronto almost matched the other team in hits blaine say something nice about what toronto has done against your team in games one and two uh their jerseys are kind of nice <laughs> <laughs> no 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 so toronto uh they've adjusted well uh their their coach keith has done his job and he has made the adjustments they need uh that's something they've done all year, and I'm not surprised by this. They're well coached. They have good, solid veteran professionals who are leading the way for them. So the adjustments that we saw, I think we'll be able to see more of. There's going to be obvious tit for tat with adjustment, but this is an area of the game that Toronto excels. Alex, how about something nice uh, that Montreal's done? Um, their, their hustle is absolutely relentless and they're very annoying to play against. And, you know, I've seen a lot of Leaf fans on Twitter getting cocky and saying, oh, sweep, Leafs in five, whatever. I was never on board with that. I knew this series was going to go to six or seven games at least. And, um, it, it, you know, I always knew right from the start, Montreal is going to do everything in their power to eliminate the Leafs in round one. And they've done a really, really good job of that. I knew the series wasn't going to come easy. And uh, they're really making the Leafs work for uh, – any wins that they get. So I have really liked their hustle and just how, uh, how hard they've pushed them and how hard they've driven them. Dreg last week, uh, you started out by surprising the world when you said something nice about Austin Matthews. So how about you uh, continue it today with uh, something nice about the Leafs? Uh, their forecheck. I think their forecheck has been tremendous. Uh, it's keeping Montreal back. Uh, and really, Montreal's having a, especially in game two, is having a hell of a time trying to get in just into the Leaf zone, let alone set up and do anything. Uh, I'll also note that the penalty kill for Toronto has been exceptional. Um, Montreal just can't get set up, and that is due to their forecheck. They, they're meeting them at the red line. They're not letting them come in too deep and letting them set up. And I think that was... It was pre prevalent in game one, but I think it was one of the big keys in game two to why Montreal offense is really not there. So there you go. See, we can be nice to each other to uh, how vicious social media has been this week. But uh, there it is being nice in the Maple Leafs lounge. 
If you're liking what you're hearing and seeing, please subscribe to this YouTube channel and to our podcast network now on iHeartRadio and follow us on all your favorite social media sites, thehockeywriters.com. So controversy in game two in uh, a challenged goal. Uh, Carey Price afterwards was asked about three times and he said, I haven't seen the replay and he wouldn't talk about it. So, uh, you know, we always see this through our own team's eyes and I'm not going to pretend I'm totally uh, Steve Harvey here and, and say totally neutral. I didn't understand the challenge. I, I looked at it a million times thinking, am I missing something? And I was trying to watch, trying to watch. Um, but Blaine, what, what, did Montreal see and and was that the bad call on the referees? <sighs> what did Montreal see? Well, this call came from Bergevin. This was not Ducharme making the call. He they got onto the walkie-talkie, called down, and they they told him make this call. Um, in watching the replay, you can see uh, Thornton lift Price's stick, but it's a little bit behind when the puck is already in in his legs. So I don't think it's really part of the play. Uh, had it happened uh, maybe a quarter second sooner. Sure. But I, I don't understand why they, it, maybe they did this because they wanted to try and get some kind of momentum back. But when you've already had three power uh, penalties against you in a row in the last seven minutes of the, uh, of gameplay, br doing this challenge is just begging to have a fourth in a row especially with goaltender interference, nobody knows what it is anymore. It's basically a coin flip. So I, I thought it was a, a reckless use of a challenge. Wow. I was, I was thinking you were going to be more of a supporter on the Montreal side. So Treg, did you see it differently? Did, did Kerry, uh, was he interfered with? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> sorry to disappoint. Um, I thought it was a, a, if there's one replay where they blow it up and go right in, you can see Thornton's stick kind of under carry prices, but you can't tell if Price lifts his stick or if Thornton lifts his stick. And it's after the puck is already pretty much behind Price anyway. So uh, I don't know why. The, uh, Bergman looked adamant up in the press box there or up in his little room that it was a, a thing. I uh, I don't know. I'm like, maybe they were just hoping that coin flip would go their way and they would uh, they would call it. Uh, other than that, I think it was a waste of a challenge, and uh, I was not shocked when it was called a goal. So, uh, Bergevin hadn't looked that angry since the last time we saw him in Dallas. Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, I guess we're flipping the script now. You've got to say Joe Thornton definitely interfered. <laughs> uh, sure, um, but I, I mean, no, that was I, I agree with both uh, Treg and Blaine. That was a very very poor judgment to try and make the challenge right then and there. I could understand if it impeded his ability to make the save, but as I mentioned, Puck was already going in the net. It was already in between his legs, going in behind him. Even if they had a case, it wouldn't have been enough to overturn it because it was very light contact. It wasn't like Joe Thornton actually bumped into him or anything like that. It was very light and it was very difficult to try and overturn no matter what. All right. And Alex, I'm guessing you're thinking the same thing. Alex, you're on mute, bud. Classic. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking the exact same thing. Um, it was it was a very bold move for Bergevin to challenge that, uh, especially considering the fact that, you know, as cold as the Leafs power play has been lately, like, like Treg and Blaine said, you're giving them four power plays in a row. And calling trying to challenge something that was so obviously a goal and then having to go on the penalty kill and risk potentially giving up a third goal that would ice the game more or less. I mean, I know the Leafs aren't exactly famous for their ability to hold four, one leads, but uh, yeah, I, um, I, I, I think that the Leafs may have, or the, uh, the Habs made the wrong call by uh, challenging that very bold move from Bergevin. All right. So that said, the, Penalties certainly were one-sided in game two. Um, it, I, I thought maybe because the Leafs power play was so awful that this was just an opportunity for them to, for, for Montreal to uh, take a breather for a little while. But um, Peter, now, as we said, we always see this through our own team's eyes, but uh, it seemed to me like Montreal was certainly in the sin bin a lot. And it, 
there's always so many calls on the ice that can go either way and, and calls that are missed, but certainly Montreal got dinged a lot in game two. Yeah. And the talk online was mostly all the retaliatory penalties. And I think that's where, you know, maybe some fans are getting a little bit upset and saying, okay, Toronto did something questionable yet fans are getting picked on. And this is me playing hockey growing up as well. I was always guilty of doing this whenever I got tripped or hit. I would retaliate back and I'm the one that would get the, I would be the one getting the penalty. That's always going to be the case, especially in the playoffs right now. Um, Some of them were warranted. Some of them, I guess it could go either way, but at the same time, it's just, they had a hard time to just stay out of the box. And uh, uh, lucky for the Maple Leafs, the power play started to click with going two for five. And the last time that has happened was March 3rd. So it worked out for the Maple Leafs, not so much for the Habs, even though the last game they had, three over the glass delayed game penalties that went into Habs favor, but it was still kind of close in regards to penalties for both sides in game one. We got a little bit of insight from that too. Uh, Keith said after game two um, that he didn't like the call against them either. I, the, I still don't know what that call was with Hyman on to know, but um, they, they said that this was kind of the game plan because Montreal had said they're going to be physical that Toronto knew they had to, uh, as they say, move their feet and draw penalties. And it seemed like that worked. And we kind of saw it in game one when Austin Matthews turned his back and was getting yanked back and forth and just had a smile on his face because he's like, this is the game plan. Uh, yeah. Blaine, is, is it the game plan on Toronto working or were the refs uh, only seeing this uh, through one team last night? Uh, I don't think it's it's the <clears throat> really the game plan and I'm not going to blame the refs in this. Um, you, you watch around the, uh, around the NHL. It, it's, it's the same in every series. There's, it seems that one team is getting dinged a lot more than another and you can't really place why it, I, yes. Toronto ha- knows that the, the physicality is coming and, and they're a, a more skilled team they use, they use their speed a lot more. So by following that route, if you keep your feet moving, you'll tend to get more calls your way. Uh, the over the glass penalties in the first game, I mean, those are automatic. You have to call those. Outside of that, there has been a lot of non-calls going both ways that have not been getting made, but do get made on the other side at times. And at inopportune times, like the, the penalty against uh, Hyman, that was a clear hold. Uh, when Deneau was the last man back, which would have created a scoring chance. I like those kinds of penalties. The other ones I found are, were a little bit ticky tack because if there's not a scoring chance being created, don't call it, let them play. But that's my personal view on it. <clears throat> um, overall, Toronto's adjusted well. Tor- as I mentioned at the top of the uh, top of the show, they adjust well and they did adjust well to the, penalties and the physicality which then creates more chances for power plays montreal has uh, it's it's physical game in game two <clears throat> they lost control of themselves so all the penalties that were called against montreal were penalties the arguments now fall on why are non-calls not being made and why aren't those specific ones not being made so you can have arguments until the cows come home but unless we know uh, we get into the head of a referee, we'll never know why they do these things or how they manage the games. And it's across the NHL, and it's not just against one team. There is no conspiracies. So, Treg, um, Kakanyemi was, was asked uh, about penalties, and he said, uh, you guys know I can't answer that, and uh, there's lots out there. So, yeah, I guarantee every, every shift there's something that can be called for sure. But um, there were a lot of calls towards the Habs. I wasn't all that upset about the calls towards the Habs. If you're going to play a tough, hard-hitting game, you're going to get calls, especially like what you guys said, Toronto just kept moving their feet. I think maybe one call, I think the slash Lekkonen had, I thought was a bit weak. I thought that was a bit... Uh, uh, mine was the non-calls, and uh, not, I'm, I'm going to sound a little biased here, but unlike Blaine, I blame the refs. I think the refs have been te- refing has been terrible across the league all year. It's been inconsistent. It's been uh, – I mean, we actually had a ref put into early retirement for admitting 
that they make makeup calls. Um, and nothing changed afterwards. It, it never changed. Um, and I'm going to say, I, I think there's a lot of penalties, blatant penalties that Toronto had that just went uncalled. Hyman's uh, on the back of Cotton Yemi, the boarding that should, should have been a boarding call. Um, there was an elbow to, I mean, I can pick them all up. There was an elbow to Gallagher. There was this, there was that. And there was calls again, I'll admit there was calls that Toronto did call, but I just found Toronto got the calls when they needed them and Montreal didn't really get any. And that game was full of penalties, both, both teams. And if you're going to, I'm not a fan of makeup calls, but like Blaine says, if you're going to call something on one team, you got to call it on the other. If it's taken away a scoring play, you got to call it. If you're not going to call it, don't call it at all, period. End of story. And uh, I just find John Cooper, Craig Berube, uh, one other uh, coach in this just this week has been complaining about refereeing. So obviously it's a league-wide issue. And uh, I don't know, maybe the NHL has teams they want to go farther than other teams. I'm throwing that conspiracy out there. I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Alex, we'll let you uh, have the final word on this one. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I I don't know if I go as far to say as there's a conspiracy uh, for certain teams to win, but having said that, I do think that the officiating is a big problem across the NHL. I think we've seen it all year. Um, different guys have different opinions and see the game differently, and you know, you'll see you'll see hits get called, and you'll see uh, sorry, you'll you'll see weaker hits get called, and then you'll see stuff that should be you know you could you could argue fine where they go uncalled. So uh, I don't really have much else to say that you guys didn't already say. I think it's been pretty bad on both sides maybe a little more in Toronto's favor last night but uh yeah there, there hasn't been any consistency across the league this year and in this series Treg you had uh said in our in our preview uh when we were talking about players that can perform on this one and that we should be watching out for and I was surprised when Eric Stahl wasn't mentioned and now I know why he's not playing very well for Montreal I, I'm really surprised um, what, what are, who needs to pick it up other than stall for, for, uh, the Canadians going forward here. Nick Suzuki and Brendan Gallagher, uh, Brendan Gallagher had two sweet chances in the slot to put the, you know, it would have put Montreal actually up, up by two goals instead of two, nothing instead of one, nothing. And he went over the top of the net each time. Uh, Nick Suzuki is another guy who was hot going into the playoffs and so far in two games, you don't even know he's on the ice. Um, yesterday, uh, game two didn't help because uh, Montreal spent pretty much the second period in the penalty box. So you're, you're not going to see those guys do what they do, but to, to pick up their game. I mean, I, I could list off a handful of people that should pick up their game, but the, the two biggest ones for me, because they're on the top two lines and especially since your guys' second line with Tavares out, it's not as uh, productive. This is the chance for Suzuki and Toffoli to uh, pick away at that line and create some scoring chances. And uh, they're just not doing it. So I, I would go with Suzuki and Gallagher. Peter, who on Toronto has been uh, underperforming to this point? Um, considering that, you know, game one was, you know, a lot, uh, very emotional. Not a whole lot of players performed well, especially after the uh, Tavares incident. But everybody seemed to step their game up for game two. And that was really surprising that it was a full team effort. Um, I mean, I really don't mean to nitpick, but maybe Joe Thornton could probably just be a little bit better with his puck management. But other than that, I really have no concerns or major uh, player that needs to step it up because everyone played their part in that win. Alex, do you got anybody that needs to uh, bring up their game in the playoffs? No, I think Peter hit the nail on the head. If you had asked me yesterday, I probably would have said Mitch Marner, and I probably would have said Joe Thornton. I probably would have said a handful of guys. But after last night's game, I was actually sitting here trying – I was looking through the questions that you had posed, Kevin, and I was trying to think of uh, guys that – need to step up and I couldn't come up with anyone uh, like Peter said maybe Joe Thornton a little bit but even then Thornton threw what like five hits last night or something yeah. like the old man's got he, the old man's throwing the body you love to see it so uh, yeah I, I after last night's game it's hard for me to pick out anybody that really needs to drastically improve but <clears throat> like Peter said maybe Thornton if anyone but uh, other than that I think everyone played a really good game yesterday and Thornton also gave the kiss to Sandine. So <laughs> yes, that too. <laughs> that, that alone is worth it. 
Blaine, uh, obviously Montreal's uh, on the short end on this one with needing their players to show up a bit more. And there, I've heard the call for Cole Caulfield. Uh, is that what you guys are thinking? Yeah. Um, the Canadians are averaging one and a half goals a game so far in this series. And Caulfield is by far their most talented shooter. There, there's, it, it's, there's no doubt. The, it's a massive gap between him and the next guy. So having him sitting out so far, uh, to me, has been a bit of a, a question. Like, why would you do this? I realize he's a rookie, but you can still play him on a lower, on a lower line, shelter him a little bit, and then give him power play time. Especially when your power play has been horrendous all year long. Uh, which surprises me that Toronto is actually sitting right next to Montreal with their percentage overall throughout the season, looking at their lineup. I'm like, how, how, um, but don't worry. The Canadians solved that for you last night. Um, so yeah, the Caulfield Caulfield has to play in game three. Uh, people like Tatar just haven't shown up yet. Um, so you have to insert some kind of youthful exuberant energy someone who can shoot. I mean, in game two, they brought Kotkaniemi in and he proved to be one of the best forwards they had last night. He even scored. So the young guys are the future of this team. I mean, the Canadians are right now where the Leafs were about three years ago. You know, they're, they're starting to get there. They got to give the young guys a little bit more experience before they can take that next step. So that's where they're at. So Caulfield not playing. I don't know. That's, just seems really odd. And you mentioned stall, uh, Kevin, I agree. What the hell's going on there? I don't understand uh, how he hasn't shown up yet. You expect someone of his, his pedigree to, to really step it up. So I would be, I would be all for Evans slotting in his, in his spot as well. Go with the youth lose with uh, lose or win with what brought you there. Well said. So make sure you head on over to thehockeywriters.com. Go under the Montreal Canadiens tab and check out these guys' great articles on the team that uh, your favorite team, to love or hate, is playing right now in the series. The series we've all been waiting for. And I loved when the uh, the uh, stats went up as soon as the, the game was won in game two. And they said, that's the first time the Maple Leafs have won against the Canadians since 1967 in the playoffs. Like, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing to be pointing out right now, but <laughs> it is what it is. So, Peter, what's the biggest surprise in this series so far for you? Um, I was going to say William Nylander. Um, he's been a he, – it seems like when the playoffs are all around, he's elevating his game, and we saw that in the last two, especially last night. But um, – in game two, but I think Rasa Sandin, I mean, I, I was really excited for him going in, getting the power play uh, top unit, um, getting that ice time. Despite playing third uh, pairing minutes, I really thought that he's doing a tremendous job with his movements, uh, his passing, his uh, uh, puck rushing abilities, everything is just clicking for him and him scoring that goal last night. You can't help but be happy for him because he's starting to succeed. He, played well in that first pairing role when Morgan Riley was set against Vancouver, thrived in that spot, and he's just continuing to get better and better and better. And it would have surprised me maybe down the line a year or two, as Alex mentioned in an article before, he's going to be your top pairing defenseman at some point. So I was really impressed with him. Alex, I think he's just stole your guy. Do you have anybody <laughs> else, any, maybe Sorry. even on Montreal, that uh, what are the biggest surprises in games one and two to you? Believe it or not, Peter actually did not steal my answer there. Um, <clears throat> my biggest surprise in the series so far has actually been Alex Kerfoot. And I think Kerfoot is a guy that, you know, when you share a team with Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, William Nylander, go down the list of guys, and you don't necessarily bring the veteran or the grizzled, like, grinder edge, like Wayne Simmons or a Joel Thornton or a Spezza, you're kind of going to get lost in the mix a little bit. You're not going to be talked about enough. But especially last night, but through these both these two games, I think Alex Kerfoot's kind of played a bit. We'll, we'll call him like a diet Brendan Gallagher almost. Like he, he's been a he's been a little bit of a low key uh, version of him. He's he's been very annoying. He's kind of 
he just say he, he's been relentless on the four check. And I think that third line in general last night with Pierre Engvall did really well. And to me, Alex Kerfoot's just a guy who he is what he is. He comes exactly as advertised. He's not making too much money. Uh, I think he's been a really solid player last night. I think he was a really solid player last night. I think he deserves a little more credit for how he kind of held the Habs down. 3.9 million is no longer a lot of money, according to Alex. So, <laughs> uh, Blaine, big surprises in games one and two? Um, <clears throat> Player-wise, I would say possibly uh, a good surprise. Uh, I'm trying to find a good surprise here. I'm trying. I'm digging. Um, <laughs> for the Leafs, uh, for me, the big uh, the big surprise is just how well Nick Foligno has, has adjusted. I, I've been a Nick Foligno fan for years. Um, know his family. They're great people. So watching him succeed, uh, I wouldn't mind seeing him lose in the first round, but that's just me. Um, on the Canadian side, I, I guess a good surprise would be, jeez, um, the fact that Montreal's defense, you haven't heard a lot from them. And with the way it's, it's structured, that's what you want. You don't want to be hearing their names called that much. And they haven't. So it, it means that they're doing their job properly for the most part. Uh, there's there's going to need to be uh, some changes made. But that's been my biggest surprise. I thought for sure that after the first two games, there would be a lot of... Uh, a lot of ink running in Montreal about specific players on the blue line, but I don't see it happening. So that, to me, that's a good surprise. All right. So Treg, I'm going to just say it. The guy with the Jersey behind you has been a surprise for me. Carey Price hadn't played since April 19th. His first game action was in the AHL and uh, went uh, stopped 13 of 15. And I was like, Oh, maybe Carey's not going to be so good. I think he's played very well, um, but is there is there anybody else? You guys have a, have a high bar there for your goaltenders, so is there anybody else uh, surprising you? Uh, in a positive way? <laughs> it can go I, either way. I, I was happy with Kotniemi's play last night. He got the goal, uh, first goal of the game, and I thought he played a solid game throughout with the minimal minutes that he got. Uh, a lot of that due to all the uh, penalty kill time. Uh, but I'm also I'm impressed with Joel Edmondson for Montreal and the defense. I mean, Blaine says uh, our defense, no one's getting mentioned for bad or good. But I think Edmondson's been just playing the same game he played all year. He's been very solid. He played over six minutes of PK uh, uh, last night, uh, 20 some odd minute, 24 minutes or something like that overall. And I just think he's playing. Uh, I, I just love his game. He's just playing a good game. He, he, he's He's uh, clearing the puck well. He, he's checking his man well. He's not losing the man he's covering. Uh, and and with a team like Toronto, that's exactly what you have to do. You got it. You can't let your. I mean, that's how Spet someone left Spezza. He came in, and scored a goal. Uh, you know, and that and that's how Toronto's going to beat you. Uh, someone left Math Matthews alone in front of the net. He scores the rebound. Um, and, and that's how you're going to get. Uh, the one positive I have was that Matthew scored three points last night. So this shows that the next two games, he probably won't get any because in the playoffs, <laughs> Matthews only scores one or two games a series. So that that's, that's a positive for me as well. All right. So that's, that's our first keys to the game is uh, allow Matthews to, to have <laughs> one and then uh, let him go away, I guess. If you're <laughs> Montreal. Uh, Treg, what else is the keys to games three and four? They're they're back to back coming up here uh, for for Montreal to to uh, send it back to Toronto with a, possibly a three, uh, yeah, three one series lead. Oh, for both games, um, I think it's going to be hard pressed for either team to win both games. Um, if Montreal, but I I do believe game three is a pivotal game for Montreal. Uh, I think they got to go back to their game one game plan. Uh, the Leafs don't like to be hit. Uh, we all know that. Um, and they need to start hitting them, take away their time and space. And they got to figure out their forecheck. Uh, if they don't, uh, the, the long ice pass seemed to kind of work for Montreal to get the, the guy loose, especially a guy like Anderson. Uh, if they insert Cole Caulfield there, you have a, a, a guy who can put the puck anywhere in the net, uh, you know, whatever opening Campbell leaves, he can almost pick it. Um, 
but that, I think that's Montreal's game plan. Go back to the game plan part uh, at number uh, in game one, and on an ice man on ice management, uh, the same players are going to play in game th- four. So manage your ice, manage your minutes, make sure your guys aren't wore out for uh, for game four, so you can uh, play an, another physical game. But I think that's the game plan they had in game one is they have to go back to in game three. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll admit I've defended the North division all, all year long. Um, people said it was the weak division and all these things. I love playoff hockey. I can't get enough. I've been watching it all. And I've got to say pretty much every other series is far more physical than anything we've seen in Montreal and Toronto. And that was a bit surprising to me knowing you know, game one, I think is a bit of a write-off, but game two, I thought they were going to come out and pound. Um, they got 46 to, to Toronto's 36, I believe, for hits. And is, Blaine, is that, is that, are we going to see a little bit more of kind of what we've been seeing in the Tampa series and the Pittsburgh series, Washington, you know, or are we going to see more of that real physical playoff hockey uh, for, for games three and four? Um, no, <laughs> in a word, no, uh, I think we're, we're pretty much where we're going to be at now. Y- you look at the other series and in the other divisions I've watched, uh, I've watched games across the NHL all year long and each division has its own, uh, officiating flavor, the, the, what they've allowed and what they haven't allowed. And I found that in the other divisions, they have allowed a lot more of the physical aspect because it seems maybe it's a, I don't know, a marketing thing down in the United States where that sells. Um, I don't know. It's just a, just a hunch, uh, a guess, because in the North division, I found it was a lot less physical and I don't think it's going to change. Um, going into game three and four, I agree with Treg. Uh, the Canadians do have to return to that more physical play that they had before with one little caveat. They have to stay disciplined. They were completely undisciplined in game two. So when you're playing undisciplined and you're retaliating, as soon as you you lay your hit, you'll take a little slash. Don't turn around slash back. That's the kind of lack of discipline that costs the Canadians that game. So in game two, so they have to get away from that in games three and four. Um, The, the Leafs took away the neutral zone from the Canadians in game two to get that back Treg's right. More speed is needed. Caulfield can do that. Um, and, and don't look for those cross ice passes anymore. They have to go back to their system where they play as tight five man unit. When they, when the Canadians succeed, their five man unit is usually within a 15 foot space of each other. And they'll have to return to that and play that tight man unit. If they want to break through the Leafs quasi trap that they had, they, they were played in game two. Blaine, very interesting point on the refs because they did stay in their own divisions. They were, they were under all these COVID protocols and everything else. The, the North has always had the same refs. And like you said, in the other divisions too. So very interesting insight on that. Um, because I, I think a lot of us in Canada, anyway, we haven't watched those, uh, those U S teams as much. And now you're watching it going, wow, like, yeah, uh, that's just some pound ground hockey going on down there right now. Um, Peter, that's the kind of hockey that Toronto would not be wanting to see. So what are the keys for Toronto in games three and four? Um, I thought they did a good job of this um, in game two, be the antagonizer, you know, try and bait them in. And we saw that with Wayne Simmons. I, I was shocked to see Wayne Simmons on that top line with Matthews and Hyman to start the faceoff, And he's going right after Josh Anderson set the tone right away. Um, we saw him get into it again with Anderson later as he hits him down to the ice. Uh, there was that incident with Sherrod and I believe it was Edmondson in the third period. And he's going to the bench, just like moving his glove. Um, playing that role, get inside their heads. I think that's what Wayne Simmons was brought into the, was brought here to do. And it's at a point now where he's got to do that. And he's playing a really great factor. And honestly, just continue playing the speed game, uh, getting in good body position. We saw last night that, you know, Paul Byron had a cross check on Pierre Engvall late in the game that created a skirmish. So with that, you're already inside the Habs head right now. You dominated that game. You have the momentum, 
go over into Montreal. I, I, I like uh, Treg said, I don't think it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard pressed for any team to take two. If you get a split out of that and come back to Toronto, you're still in a good spot. Um, just carry the momentum and keep it going. Alex, final words on uh, keys to the next games. Yeah, I'm going to piggyback on the end of uh, Peter's point there and just say that they have to keep the momentum going. You know, uh, I, I think coming into last night's game, they all had heavy hearts thinking of their captain. And uh, I think they really went out and won that game for him. And I think the mindset now, as we've seen in quotes from Jason Spezza, the whole point of wanting to win games is that so if there's even a sliver of a chance that down the stretch, should they make it to the conference finals or the cup final, that John Tavares would be able to return. I mean, if that's not enough motivation for you to go out and play your hardest every night, I don't know what is. And um, I think along with that, I mentioned this in my article yesterday, they just have to not shoot themselves in the foot. Kyle Dubas can't offer them anything else. He plugged just about every single need that they had. And at this point, it's all up to the guys themselves if they want to go further than the first round for the first time since 2004. So uh, I think uh, I think they just got to not shoot themselves in the foot. They can't be their own worst enemy, and they just have to keep the momentum going and keep the pedal in the metal. So in our playoff preview, we, we set our predictions and uh, we, we completely glossed over the other North Division series where we just all said Edmonton will win. Well, Edmonton's down 2-0. Uh, they just have not shown up at all. Winnipeg was limping into the playoffs and looked like they were going to be, they just wanted to hit the golf course. Uh, some beautiful golf courses around the Winnipeg area. So maybe that was what it was, but apparently not. Uh, so this is our chance, guys, to um, to revisit our predictions in the North Division. And now we cannot gloss over the other series. So so we'll start off with you, Blaine. Uh, who's winning which series and, and how many games? Well, I'm going to stick to my original prediction with that uh, Edmonton-Winnipeg series and say Winnipeg in six. There you go. Blaine wasn't on the playoff preview show, so he knew all along we should have had him on. <laughs> so, uh, and Blaine, what are you calling for this Montreal Toronto series? I haven't seen anything to change my mind so far. So I'm going to stick to my original prediction that I made on Habs Unfiltered and that's uh, Leafs in seven. All right. Treg, I, I know that uh, you also called Leafs. I think it was in six. Um, and are you sticking with that? And are you, uh, what are you thinking of the other series? I'm still sticking with Leafs and six, uh, and the other series, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I don't, I forget what I said before, to be honest with you. Um, I think I said Edmonton, but I didn't give any games, but, uh, I'll, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with my thing. I'll still say Edmonton, uh, and, uh, We'll see what I mean. I never thought McDavid would have a point in two games in the in the playoffs, but uh, yeah, I'll stick with Edmonton. All right, Alex, you're up. Um, so I'm going to modify my prediction a little bit. I think I said Leafs in six first time around. I'm going to change it to Leafs in seven. Um, I have a hard time seeing the Leafs coming out of this back to back winning both games, and I just have this gut feeling that if they get back to Montreal for game six and Montreal has some fans in the building, I think they're going to win that game. So I think that this series is going to go to seven, but I do think the Leafs get the edge in the end. And in terms of the Winnipeg Edmonton series, like Treg, I also don't remember what I said. I know I took Edmonton, but I don't remember how many games, but uh, I, I'm going to go Edmonton in seven games because if I were the Winnipeg Jets, I'd be terrified that McDavid doesn't have a point through the first two games. I think I'm just waiting for uh, him and Dreisaitl to explode and uh, they're going to put it all out in front of them in a couple games. So Peter, final word. Um, I'm going to stick with my predictions just because I said it, I'm going to stick with it no matter what, if, what the outcome is going to be. But um, I still think Toronto in six, even if it does go to Montreal with the fans in there, I think Toronto is still going to use that to their advantage and silence the crowd. Um, if it gets to that point, if it gets a seven, um, still come back to the home barn. I, something that you don't want to do, but you know what? I'm still going to say Toronto in six and try and silence the crowd in Montreal. And I had Edmonton in six. Uh, last time McDavid and Matthew or McDavid and Dreisaitl, why did I say McDavid and Matthews? McDavid and Dreisaitl <laughs> were shut out back to back was against the Maple Leafs. So um, it's difficult to see that. I can't see them being off the score sheet for three straight games. I'm still going to say Edmonton in six, but if it does end up being in Winnipeg in six or 
Winnipeg in five, that wouldn't surprise me because they're doing a really damn good job of shutting them down no matter what. I said Toronto in five, and I'm going to stick with that. Uh, I should switch it to six or seven, but I, I am going to say the way <laughs> they are, the way that they are um, playing right now and game two, I, I just didn't see how Montreal can beat that. The only way is if Carey Price even plays better or they get, uh, get some scoring punch, like you guys have mentioned, but uh, I'm not seeing anything that Montreal can do at this point to turn the tide um, other than kind of the, the keys that we have talked about. And I'm going to say uh, Winnipeg's winning this series and I'm going to call a sweep. There you go. It's right there. Uh, I'll tell you why guys, I live in the Edmonton, Blue Alex is mine right there. I, I live in the Edmonton region. So I've got lots of oiler friends. <clears throat> and if you guys think that our franchises have felt it, their franchises felt it a lot over the last couple of years. And I've got a feeling this is going to be one of those years that is going to rip their hearts out as well, because unbelievable how the Oilers are not performing in this and how Winnipeg is. And we saw Winnipeg all season long. They're a great team. They just absolutely were horrible in the final month. And uh, now they're showing up. So yeah, it looks like a sweep to me. Well, we'll see, but now it's on, on uh, it's on YouTube for everyone to see. <laughs> so uh, our Montreal crew, this is kind of the, the time where we have a little bit of fun with the show and, and go off script. And um, we talk about what we've seen on, on social media. We try to keep it light and fun uh, because as we all know, social media can be a vicious place to be. Um, so we, we find some things that stick out as entertaining or thought provoking or just, just really funny stuff. Um, so I'm going to start guys with, uh, Bill Burr. You got to follow this comedian on Twitter. He's a big, uh, hockey fan. And, um, he put out there, he wanted translations in hockey. And, uh, so he retweeted some things, but he had a few of his own, uh, the bounces just mm -hmm. didn't go our way equals. We couldn't do a thing out there. Uh, we need to capitalize on our opportunities equals we average 15 shots a game. Uh, he's not very flashy, but he gets the job done. Uh, he didn't show up. <laughs> we need to play a physical game to slow them down. We're going to injure all their top players until they suck as bad as we do. <laughs> Tomorrow's another day. We're going to get swept. <laughs> That's a borderline hit. Someone on the other team just had their career ended. Oh, my God. Uh, he's a crafty veteran. He's an old, slow guy. Uh, a veteran savvy move. He's good at cheating. <laughs> uh, Was this a thread? Because that seems oh, like a lot to fit into one tweet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, this is a thread he had going. Uh, I'm feeling back. attacked on the veteran thing. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I could go on and on, but, but head on over to Bill Burr, funny guy and, uh, and a hockey fan. So he goes up in the, in the books for me as well. Um, Peter, did you see anything on social media that uh, had you laughing? Um, I saw that same thread. That was absolutely hilarious. Uh, Bill Burr is just a comic genius. So <laughs> shout out to Bill Burr. If he's listening. He you is. I'm sure yeah. he's a big fan of the show. <laughs> 100% friend of the show right now, but um, not necessarily funny, but very, you know, somber given how um, the Tavares situation play, uh, unfolded when um, he was being stretched off the ice. Chris Shilton said, tweeted out that Jason Spezza said Tavares was picking up his voice when he was down on the ice. So he kept uh, talking to him to keep him responsive. Um, that just really, you know, yanked my heart out of my chest. I was very gut wrenching to, to see and or read that given what was happening and we see uh we saw Spezza standing over him to make sure that everything was okay and the fact that he scored the tying goal was just very fitting in that game um it seemed like you know it was fate um everything the stars were lined up so reading that comment was very heartbreaking but seeing him score the goal just it was very fitting 
And since we're talking about that situation, I'll say from Montreal for them to send out that tweet uh, mm -hmm. while it was going on that they were thinking of him and they were hoping for the best. Really classy um, move there. Uh, we saw a lot of class in the, in the hockey community around that situation. Blaine, was there anything you saw on social media uh, this week or, or maybe your kids pointed out to you since I'm not sure if you're on social media? Oh, no, I'm on it. Uh, <laughs> so are my grandkids. But um, <laughs> uh, when I'm not uh, playing around with hockey, I'm usually hanging around military social media where we kind of, so this week it's been, because it's Victoria Day in Canada, we've been kind of trolling the American military side with uh, pictures of Hawaiian pizzas and long weekends and Canada geese attacking. And it's been going back and forth. So... <laughs> The, uh, the good-natured ribbing between Canada, U.S. militaries just playing around, that's the, that's the stuff that I've seen on social media this week. Great. Alex, anything on, uh, on your feed sticking out? Nothing really funny, I would say, but I, I do want I, I to talk about a tweet that kind of sheds light on my uh, biggest surprise uh, point from earlier. So this comes from Drag Like Poll on Twitter, and he says, with the Engvall, Kerfoot, McKayev line on the ice tonight, the Leafs had 82% of the shot attempts, and Montreal had zero expected goals. So that's how you play defense. Don't let the other team have the puck. I think that was a very important tweet to see. And it sheds light on how... Uh, uh, how much of an impact Engvall made coming back into the lineup last night, just how effective that third line was for them in general. So you chose violence. That's what you're doing here. <laughs> More or less, yeah. <laughs> we were nice. We were nice this whole show. So no, it has it. Someone, had to be someone, someone had to be the jerk. <laughs> Don't make me get behind someone the referees. Someone had to be the jerk. Don't make me get behind the referees and throw a punch at you. You were doing whoa, so whoa. well, Alex. He's up Simmons. <laughs> Oh, it was going so well. <laughs> yeah. Oh my! Well. Yeah, had to be that guy. Had to be that yeah. guy. <laughs> Treg, uh, yeah. anything on social media sticking out to you? You want to bring up? Um, well, there's a guy that uh, writes for the hockey writers or wore a dress for his granddaughter <laughs> on social media. I don't know if anyone <laughs> still hasn't that, put but... pants on yet. <laughs> no, uh, Arpen, Arpen Basu, a uh, Montreal writer for the Athletic, I thought it was kind of funny on the challenges. I think the reason the refs took so long is they were trying to figure out why Ducharme would challenge that. So, um, you know, because it did take a long time for them yeah. to decide. And that I find it funny because it's probably true. They're probably looking at every angle going, I'm, I'm trying, trying to figure out exactly what they're trying to look for. So uh, I thought that was kind of cute. I read their lips. They were looking at each other going, really? Really? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it was great, guys. Thanks so much for uh, visiting us in the in the Maple Leafs Lounge. Uh, we hope very much that. Uh, well, if you're if you're my prediction, I guess we won't see you next week. But if uh, if it's everybody else's prediction, then then we're going to be talking again next week, and we are going to be right in the thick of things. Um, but it, you know, it's it's playoff hockey. It's uh, it's Toronto and Montreal. We love this. We're going to talk about it as much as we can. So thanks again for playing nice for most of the time <laughs> other than uh, Alex. And uh, it was a great time and enjoy the playoffs, everybody. And everybody stay healthy out there. We will see you next week in the Maple Leafs Lounge.